Most of this train goes over 5,000 metres and has the highest train station in the world aboard it. And now, on this train, throughout the cabins, we even have little places to put in our oxygen masks in case the altitude requires us to have oxygen. We've just gone past Dogalay, which is the world's highest train station. I would have liked to have taken you out and shown you around it, but we just went whoosh right by. Morning and welcome to Lhasa, Tibet, home of the Dalai Lama, region of China. Well, so the Chinese say. One of the interesting things, just as a way of introduction, is there are a lot of these stupas dotted around Lhasa and people will only walk around them clockwise. That's the tradition. So in fact, oh, it must be a Chinese car because he's breaking the rules. So in fact there's lots of these stupa type things around Lhasa, so almost everyone in this old town is wandering around the entire old town in a clockwise direction. Anyway, Lhasa, Tibet. I'm about to enter the 1300 year old Zhou Kang temple. I'm not allowed to film inside because it's the most revered, most spiritual place in all of Tibet. The statue of the Buddha inside this temple is the one that most people come on pilgrimage to see. And outside this temple waiting to come in are a whole lot of pilgrims prostrating themselves, giving testament to the importance that this temple maintains in the world of Tibetan Buddhism. And this is the Seda Monastery, just outside Lhasa, built in about 1400. Okay. This is the uh, Dadan Mingyu Palace. This was designed and built for the 14th Dalai Lama, that's the current Dalai Lama. Built between 1954 and 1956. And unfortunately, for most of the time, the Dalai Lama hasn't been able to live here and, thanks to the Chinese authorities, still can't. It really surprises me, well it shouldn't when you think geopolitically, about Lhasa is the enormous amount of police you see everywhere. So, first day in uh, Lhasa in Tibet, first impressions. Oh, the landscape is, is amazing. But, out of all of the countries I've been in, all the regions I've been in, this one feels more like being under occupation than any other. There is such a strong differentiation between the Han Chinese culture and the Tibetan culture. Now, I see in the Tibetans here a lot of similarities with the Bhutanese, but you also see with the Han Chinese a lot of similarities with Beijing. And these two cultures are just clashing. I'm standing in what I call Tiananmen Square Junior. It's not really its name, but when you look around behind me, it looks surprisingly like Tiananmen Square with soldiers, flags, the whole bit. And across the road, you get a lot of fortress. And for me, this is the great juxtaposition right here between Tibetan culture and Han Chinese culture. And this is the uh, Potala Palace. This used to be the heart of independent Tibetan government the Dalai Lama used to rule from. There's been construction on here since about 700 AD, but this palace started its construction in 1465 AD and took 50 years to build. 13 stories and a thousand rooms and is probably Lhasa's most recognisable landmark. You know, I always feel reluctant to complain about tourists when I am one. But this place is bleeding Chinese tourists. Every time you turn around, another tour group is coming out at the top of their voices. So what should be a place of meditation is a place of Mandarin at a high pitch and high volume. If I was a Tibetan, I'd be signing up to fight, I tell you. These people's culture is being destroyed, if nothing else, because Han Chinese tourists are coming in to look at the Tibetan zoo as if what remnants of Tibetan culture remains 
is simply for the pleasure of Chinese tourists to come and point and prod and squeal at the top of their voices. I'm in a cave underneath the Patala fortress in Lhasa, Tibet, teaching a Han Chinese how to use chopsticks because she didn't know how to pick up dumplings with chopsticks. We're overlooking Yamdule Lake. We're at about 5,200 metres at the Yamdule Pass. Tibet heading for Nepal. Well, actually, firstly, Everest Base Camp that way. There are a few curiosities here in Tibet as we're walking along one of these rural areas. You can see that far from the development of Lhasa, there is still a lot of poverty where people dry their cow dung mixed with straw to be both uh, building products and heating products in winter. Now this brings us to some larger developmental questions about Tibet. There's a lot of people in the West who are no, uh, um, automatically assume that the Chinese are wrong. And I have to say my initial impressions here are that China is like an occupying power and I haven't felt anywhere as much like an occupied country as here. But China uses two justifications. One, a historical claim over territory, and I need to look into a lot more depth to decide whether there is any validity there. And secondly, to end a repressive regime. We in the West look to the Dalai Lama and we assume he's a man of peace, and he actually is. But what was the governance structure of Tibet before China came? Well, under the 13th Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama before the current one, and a couple of years under the 14th Dalai Lama before he fled, the best description of Tibet is a theocratic feudalist state. And that is a theocratic dictatorship with a feudal lordship system underneath that. Now that the 14th Dalai Lama has brought in some democratic reforms, a degree of them, there is a bit more of a separation between the theocracy and the governance. In a way, it's a bit like Iran. You've got a theocratic overlord with the Ayatollah and a selected group of candidates who can run for the presidency, as you see going on in Iran today. But here are some amazing things that you may not have known about the theocratic feudalism of Tibet. Slavery was allowed into the early 1900s. That is, less than a hundred years ago, slavery was permitted here. The brutal torture and imprisonment of people that stepped outside the feudal system saw removal of limbs as punishment, brutal eye gouging and things like that. So at least under the 13th Dalai Lama and his predecessors and the feudal overlords of those times, maybe the Chinese had a point. A theocratic feudalism is not such a great governance structure. With the prayer flags bouncing around my shoulders, we're now passing through the Katsala Pass, which is 5,200 metres, and officially entering into the Himalayas. Oh, Everest Base Camp, here we come. When you think of the forces at play of India subsuming underneath the Asian continent and pushing this up, making the Himalayas still grow today, and look at all this stuff, I get excited at watching the Earth shape itself, and this this is a great place. I should have been a geologist. Ah, David Attenborough eating your heart out. That, that is the little hill that Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay walked up back in 1953. That is Mount Everest and this is the roof of the world. China Post Post Office at 5,150 metres, Everest Base Camp, highest post office in the world. Here at 
Everest base camp. It's a little bit foggy so you can't see Everest at the moment. But I'm here with my mate, the Yak. Say hi, Yak. Come on. Anyway, that's the Yak at Everest base camp. Just on top of the cloud is the summit of Mount Everest. I have seen the summit of Mount Everest. No, it's even surprised me how excited I got at the first glimpse of the massive of Mount Everest and when the summit peaked above the clouds and we could actually see clear as you like the summit of Mount Everest. I got so excited. Just about to cross the border from Tibet into Nepal, but before we do, let me show you how the landscape changes from Everest Base Camp down to the Nepali border. It's phenomenal. Nothing's gonna make me cry Like a fish swimming the sea Living every day in happy dreams Never call me a, never call me a cultural heathen So leaving <coughs> Tibet into Nepal Having lunch on the border What do I order? A toasted ham cheese and tomato sandwich 